Warning. <coughs> no, it's not, sorry, not going to work. <coughs> I was going to include a Nile Red parody, but I forgot to record one, so we're just going to have to pretend one's here. Anyway, welcome everyone to the first episode of the Exotic Thermite series. In these videos, I will be attempting to extract as much metal as I can from as many different metal oxides as I can find. And some other stuff. Let's begin at the beginning, as I find it's usually the best place to start. Thermite is a broad term used to describe a redox reaction in between a metal oxide and a metal, traditionally iron oxide and aluminum, as you've probably seen all over YouTube at this point. I'm a little late to the party. But as we'll see, there's a lot more to it than just that. Sometimes referred to as the Goldschmidt reaction, got its beginnings in Germany in the late 1800s by a chemist named Hans Goldschmidt who was looking for a way to produce relatively pure metal, in his case chromium, by reduction without using carbon. The reason being that alloys made at the time with chromium, reduced traditionally with carbon, were far too brittle to be used industrially or commercially. Hans worked around this by using an aluminothermic reaction, which he patented and subsequently published a paper on in 1895 and 98, respectively. So, how does this apply to us? Well, if you're like me and wanted to collect all of the elements, but felt like buying some of them just to be a bit too easy, well, here we are. I've got over 100 pounds of different types of thermite to extract the metal from, from the most basic manganese extraction to perchlorate-boosted zirconium thermite to silicothermic reduction of bismuth to a lot more. I, I don't want to give away just yet, because uh, I think I've got some great ideas, and Grant, I know you're watching. Now let's get right into it, but first let me say one quick thing. Uh, even though I'm going to be listing what amounts to be an easy to follow guide on thermite extraction, I strongly encourage you not to try this at home. Uh, these reactions can be extremely unpredictable, chaotic, and once they get going, the only way to stop it is just to let them finish on their own. Some can even react so quickly and violently that they can detonate i.e. produce a supersonic shockwave, which is not something you want happening when you're standing next to a pound of the mix. So always make sure to take proper safety precautions into account before performing these reactions or doing any chemical reactions, really. For this series, I wanted to do the reactions in a sort of increasing difficulty. So for this first video, I'll start with the basics. In terms of the reactions, I'll be showing a comparison between regular thermite and one that uses flux, a comparison between three types of commonly available iron oxide, a final larger batch of both the red and the black iron oxide, a chromium extraction, and finally an attempt to make type 304 stainless steel alloy. Uh, we'll see how that goes. So for now, let's get everything together we'll need to get started. I'll make this as quick as possible, but I will say having the proper tools is as important, if not more important, than just getting the correct stoichiometry. So the first thing on our list is to get the metal oxide that you want to extract the metal from. It's something to note that there are usually many different oxides available of the same element, each potentially more or less reactive than the other. Uh, while they're not all as dramatic in reactivity difference like with red and black copper oxide, many are not as easy to tell apart as they are. Uh, compounding that is the fact that because many of these oxides are used as ceramic pigments, many suppliers are not well versed in knowing exactly what it is they have. As far as purity of the oxide is concerned, there's really no need to pay the extra money to get the really pure stuff. 97% is more than sufficient. Next up, we'll need some aluminum powder, which at first may seem daunting given how many different kinds of it are available. Here in this shot are just a few different types that I have. But to try to control for as many variables as possible, I'll be using only one specific kind of aluminum, namely the 500 mesh 30 micron atomized spheroidal Alcoa brand. This is the typical thermite aluminum that is most commonly run into in online stores. It has a good balance between surface area and weight, and is most often the cheapest by comparison. Next we will need some type of flux to control the rate of reaction. Now, there are a few different types of commonly available flux you can use, like borax, cryolite, fluorospar, or even some of the more expensive refractory silicates. i found, though, that the best and cheapest results come from a roughly 60-40 mix of fluorospar and cryolite. This mix also has the advantage of remaining relatively inert while absorbing the heat from the reaction and simultaneously lowering the melting point of the metal. Each reaction will need a different amount of flux, though, so it's always important to start with the smallest test possible. Next, we're going to have to come up with a reaction vessel that's strong enough to withstand a 3 to 4,000 degree temperature change within about 10 seconds, and not spill the contents all over the ground, while at the same time be cheap enough to be semi-disposable. 
Yes, the answer is... The slow release mechanism of a garden flower pot. Cheap, disposable, and available almost anywhere. There's a reason they're used so often. Now, as far as lighting this stuff off goes, we have a few options. We could use a torch lighter directly on the mix, which is, to say the least, dumb. We could use magnesium ribbon, which is, while reliable, it could still be unsafe. Or we could use the permanganate glycerin method, which is the safest, but is the least reliable in my opinion. Sometimes what can happen is the permanganate layer acts as a physical barrier between the reacting glycerin and the thermite, and it never actually gets it to initiate. Also, I'd rather not add extra oxidizer to an already vigorous and chaotic reaction. So for all of the experiments in this series, we will be using magnesium ribbon made up like in this shot here. Doubling it up increases the chances that it stays lit, and bending it like it is keeps both halves from separating upon ignition. While not perfect, it is a good method. Now that the important stuff is out of the way, we can move on to the less necessary but still helpful ingredients. These are most certainly not absolutely needed to perform the experiments, but they are well worth the cost. The three in particular I'll be talking about are sand, super packs, and cabosil. The sand is useful as it takes up some room in the bottom of the pot, which helps to keep molten metal from running out the bottom. It has a tendency to stick to the slag, so I'll use a small layer of super packs between the sand and the thermite, which makes it much easier to remove after everything cools. The last thing we'll need is cabosil, which is a brand name for fumed silica, basically a very fine form of silicon dioxide that has a surface area to weight ratio a little less, but still in the same neighborhood as activated carbon. We'll be using this as an anti-caking agent, and while it doesn't make clumps disappear, it keeps new ones from forming and ensures a more evenly mixed composition. The amount to use is completely arbitrary. A little can go a long way, but I usually try for a half a gram to a gram per 100 grams of mixed composition with moderate success. Sand smoke. Don't breed this. All of that will go together to look something like this very artistic diagram. Try to build the sand up along the sides as much as possible to give the more dense metal a better chance at forming a single blob in the center. Having sand insulates the reaction, allowing for better aggregation and the increased possibility of crystal growth. Good. Now that that's out of the way, we can really get started. And the first thing we're going to take a look at is the difference between thermite with and without flux. Seems simple, but this is the first episode. I wanted to start relatively small, so for these I went with totals of 178 grams for the plain thermite, and 250 grams for the one with flux. Keeping in mind a 2.96 to 1 stoichiometric ratio of red iron oxide to aluminum, we get formulas like you see here. The 178 grams is 133 grams of iron to 45 grams of aluminum, and the 250 grams is 158 grams of red iron oxide to 54 grams of aluminum to 38 grams of flux. The 38 grams of flux is all calcium fluoride and represents 15% of the total weight. Once everything is mixed up and put into containers, we could take it out somewhere safe and get things rolling. As you could probably see, 15% was just a little bit too much to add, but it does illustrate how much of a difference the addition of flux can make. Once it cools down, we can smash it open to reveal the prize inside. The wrong amount of flux coupled with the small scale of the reaction means we didn't get a very good yield on these two, but we could adjust that to the next one.
Moving along, up next we'll look at three different types of iron oxide, red, yellow, and black. While they're all iron, you'll see they're a little different. Right away you may notice that while the red and the black iron have different ratios of iron to oxygen, the yellow iron oxide is just red iron complex with water. This means that upon heating, you can drive off that water and turn it back into red iron oxide. That means that the reaction of yellow iron oxide generates a lot of steam that leads to problems that you'll see soon. Here are the formulas I used for each reaction. I based all of them starting with a pound of oxide. For the red, the oxide aluminum flux ratio was 454 to 153 to 53 grams, making a total of 660 grams with the flux being 8% by weight. For the black, the ratio was 454 to 141 to 65 grams, making a total of 660 grams with the flux being 10% by weight. The change in the iron to oxygen ratio changes the stoichiometry, which is why this one has less aluminum. Now for the yellow, things change slightly as not all 454 grams is iron oxide. For doing the math, the water content is around 10%, so adjusting for that, we calculate the rest from 400 grams. That makes the ratio 454 to 135 to 0, for a total of 589 grams. Now we'll take it outside and light it off. For those of you who will point out the missed opportunity to light off three batches of 666 grams each, I'll say that I'd rather not potentially open a pit to hell. It's actually my theory as to why Doug's lab isn't posting videos anymore. Again, once it cools, we can break them open to see what's inside. Looking at the slag from the outside and how the reaction performed, we can make a guess as to how it'll turn out. Even though the red iron had too much flux, there was still enough of a sustained reaction to get a decent chunk of iron to form. The yellow iron, though, not so much. Because of the gases expelled and the lack of flux, we get something filled with bubbles and bonded well to the slag. The black, on the other hand, performed best and is a perfect example of result to shoot for. On top of that, something I didn't even expect to happen happened. Here in this shot is the metal from all three reactions. From left to right is black, red, and yellow. And it looks like we managed to grow some crystals. If I had to guess, these geode-like crystals are flux with iron impurities in it as a similar growth pattern with different colors appears in other reactions. Now onto the final and much larger iron reactions. You know the drill, so here are the formulas. The red iron's ratio was 1,616 to 545 to 216 grams, which gives us a total of 2,377 grams, or just a little bit over 5 pounds, with the flux being 9% of the total weight. The black iron had a ratio of 1,500 to 467 to 375 grams, which will give us a total of 2,342 grams, or just also over 5 pounds, with the flux being about 16% by weight. Once it's mixed up, we'll take it out back and see what happens.
to answer your question, yes, I did manage to lose the footage of me smashing them both open. That's okay though, as here is a shot of all the iron we've managed to extract so far shown in order. You might notice that their yields are increasing as they're scaled up, but that only works so well. The larger one of the two is from the black, but only in my guess because so much of the red was thrown out when it first started. And the flux crystals are larger in this one. That's because the voids in the slag were larger, as well as the final product being hotter for much longer. And here is a tiny piece of crystal that I recovered from the black slag. Now all that's left on our list to do is the chromium extraction, and then our attempt at making stainless steel. The chromium, which works with a stoichiometric ratio of 2.81 to 1, starts with 950 grams of the oxide, which means that the rest of the ratio is 338 grams to 0, with a eh, spoonful of potassium nitrate added for good measure. Now the chromium thermite is one of the few that actually needs to be sped up rather than slowed down with flux. A good amount is about 1 to 3 grams of the nitrate per 100 grams of mixed composition, but that's it's almost completely arbitrary. Now all that's left is to try to make some stainless steel, namely type 304 alloy, or 74% iron, 18% chromium, and 18% nickel. And the difference between that and the also common 316 stainless alloy is a few percent of molybdenum to help stop corrosion. Now the stainless mix is going to be a little trickier to get right as the listed alloy composition is in percent by raw element, and not only is it an alloy, the percent of metal in a metal oxide is different for each metal. But in doing some quick and dirty calculations we can work all that into the process. What I came up with is based on originally shooting for a pound of mixed metal oxide, so that means we'll need 315 grams of black iron oxide, 75 grams of green chrome oxide, and 36 grams of black nickel oxide to get the right alloy percentages. To reduce that, we'll need a calculated 137 grams of aluminum, and to slow all that down, I estimated needing 85 grams of flux, or about 13% by total weight. Finally, 2 grams of graphite was mixed in to get the correct amount of carbon. Looking at the chromium, not using flux led again to the spongy looking slag here. Now the 304 though seemed to work just fine, but let's see what's inside. And it looks like we have stainless steel. Admittedly I have no way to test its composition, but I may do a rust test with some iron and some commercial stainless steel in the future just to show its properties. When I watched the chrome thermite, I'll admit I was a little nervous seeing how poorly it reacted, but we actually managed to extract chromium from it. The total extracted weight of these metals for these two are 253 grams and 322 grams respectively. So now that all of the important stuff is done, let's make a volcano and try to extract the metal from it. Here we have a chemical known as ammonium dichromate, a neon orange compound that screams toxic cancer risk, so make sure not to eat it. Oh, and wear gloves. You may have seen this demonstrated before, but for those that haven't, basically we're going to make a pile of the stuff and then light it on fire. The heat will drive the reaction forward, producing ammonia gas, nitrogen, water, and green trivalent chromium oxide. The resulting chrome powder produced is extremely fluffy, and making thermite with it is going to be extremely difficult. 
We'll try to contain it as best we can and light it off. After cleaning up that mess, we can take it inside to mix up with some aluminum like regular thermite, albeit much fluffier, add in some oxidizer to help it along, and light it off. Of course I didn't press record for the reaction, but trust me there is a piece of chromium in that slag, so yes in theory it is possible to do on a larger scale. Well I guess that about wraps it up for this introduction video, but stick around because I have some very colorful reactions planned for the next videos. Thank you for watching, and try not to let yourself on fire. Uh, I'm still working on the outro.